opportunity not only to remember great lives that once lived but also would give as an occasion to relive those little moments which we have not lived with them today we are here we are in fact honored to witness the 16th pgc memorial lecture and i request madam lakshmi to begin today's program with an invocation ईशपुत्रम नमस्तुभ्यम सर्वेव नमस्कृत गणाधिपहा पार्वती प्रियनंदना पाहि गज मुख पाहि सुमुख पाहि सिद्धि विनायका पाहि सुरगणनायका पाहि गज मुख पाहि सुमुख पाहि सिद्धि विनायका पाहि सुरगणनायका शृंगपुर दोड़ बंधु ने सिंह कंबद विनायका शृंगपुर दोड़ बंधु ने सिंह कंबद विनायका बंधु बेड़े वो वर को मोदक बंधु बेड़े वो वर को मोदक पाहि गज मुख पाहि सुमुख पाहि सिद्धि विनायका पाहि सुरगणनायका भक्ति इंदली निन्न पादव मुट्टि प्रार्थने माडुवे भक्ति इंदली निन्न पादव मुट्टि प्रार्थने माडुवे भक्ष्य गणतंदर्पूत पुष्प पूजे माडुवे भक्ष्य गणतंदर्पूत पुष्प पूजे माडुवे पाहि गज मुख पाहि सुमुख पाहि सिद्धि विनायका पाहि सुरगणनायका पाहि सुरगणनायका आ पाहि सुरगणनायका थैंक यू धन्यवाद करो मी कुड आई नाउ रिक्वेस्ट मिस्टर एस विवेकानंद प्रेसिडेंट लहरी फोरम फॉर द वेलकम एड्रेस respected honorable mr justice prasanna b varale chief justice karnataka high court shri prabuling k navadgi advocate general for karnataka respected uh, judges of the honorable high court of karnataka respected registrar general high court of karnataka registrars of the high court of karnataka principal judges and members of the district judiciary the director deputy director faculty and trainee judges of the karnataka judicial academy shri dhyan chinappa additional advocate general mr vijay kumar additional advocate general shri m b nargund additional solicitor general shri shanti bhushan additional solicitor general the members of the governing council of the advocates association bangalore past presidents and secretaries of the lahari advocates forum shri l jagdish president of the literary advocates union senior advocates principals law lecturers students of law colleges 
Srimati Shushila P. Chengappa, Ms. P. Anu Chengappa, family and friends of late PGC Chengappa, Sri K. Surinarayan Rao, founder, member of the Lahari movement, dear invitees and friends. It gives me immense pleasure to welcome each one of you to the 16th annual PGC Chengappa Memorial Lecture. Sri Pulyanda Ganpati Caesar Chengappa was the first president of the Lahari Advocates Forum. Mr. PGC Chengappa was popularly known as PGC or Caesar. He was a man of lofty ideals who had a vision for the legal fraternity. With that vision in mind, the Lahari Advocates Forum was formed. The Lahari Advocates Forum initially started off as a study circle where the advocates would meet to discuss various topics and legal issues. And in the year 1987, the Lahari Advocates Forum was registered. Even to this day, we have a study circle under the name and style of Chintana Mantana happening every Thursday in the city civil court complex. The word Lahari would mean waves. True to its meaning, the Lahari movement has spread among the advocates and has spread into various fields of the advocates' areas of practice. We have other sister concerns like the Lahari Advocates, Lahari Law Academy, which is a trust which caters to the development and growth of young advocates and law students. In fact, the Lahari Law Academy conducts model parliaments and moot court competitions for young advocates and law college students. In fact, there is a, a moot court competition that is being organized on the 10th of December in the city civil court complex for the young advocates and law students. We also have the Lahari Book Bank, which encourages advocates to read biographies and autobiographies of legal luminaries to inculcate the best practices and the, uh, the, the skills among the advocates. We have the Lahari Foundation, which caters to medical emergency or emergencies of advocates in, in, uh, in need of any assistance. The Lahari Advocates Forum started off the, the PGC annual memorial lecture since 2007. We've had various legal luminaries address the PGC memorial lecture. In 2007, we had Mr. R.N. Narsimurthy, former Advocate General, Karnataka, address us on Article 356 of the Constitution. The second lecture was by Honorable Mr. Justice Santosh Hegde. The third lecture was by Justice Shivraj Patil. The fourth lecture was by Justice yes, Rajendra Babu. The fifth lecture was by Honorable Mr. Justice R.V. Ravindran. The sixth lecture was by Mr. S.S. Naganan, Senior Advocate. Seventh was by Mr. Uday Holla, Senior Advocate and former Advocate General. The eighth lecture was by Justice N. Kumar, former judge of the Karnataka High Court. The ninth lecture was by Mr. B. V. Acharya, senior advocate and former advocate general. The tenth was by Justice L. Nageshwar Rao, the Honorable Supreme Court. The eleventh lecture was by Justice V. Gopal Gowda. The twelfth lecture was by Honorable Mr. Justice Mohan M. Shantan Gowder. The thirteenth lecture was by Honorable Mr. Justice S. Abdul Nazir. The 14th lecture was by Honorable Mr. Justice Bopanna, Judge Supreme Court of India. The 15th lecture was by Honorable Mr. Justice Dinesh, Dinesh Maheshwari, Judge Supreme Court of India. Today, we have the privilege of hearing our Advocate General, Mr. Prabhuling Navadgi, on Constitution of India, a transformative charter. We have the privilege and honor of hearing the Chief Justice of the Karnataka High Court, Honorable Justice Prasanna B. Varale, would also express his views on the topic. I once again take this opportunity to extend a warm welcome
to each one of you. Thank you. I now request uh, Learned Senior Counsel RVS Naik to give us a brief insight about late uh, PGC Changapa. Honorable uh, Chief Justice of Karnataka, the judges of the High Court, Learned Advocate General Prabhuling Navadgi, distinguished members of the bar. I had the privilege of associating myself with uh, Mr. Changappa, both professionally and uh, in a personal capacity for quite some time. We had moved together closely. I was therefore uh, requested to say a few words about him this evening. Mr. Changappa was enrolled as an advocate in the year 1962. He was district government pleader from 1974 to 1981 and additional government advocate in 1997 and again in 2005 and handled many cases for the government. He was an active member of various organizations. In 1973, he was elected as the General Secretary of the Bangalore Bar Association. In 1973, he arranged an endowment lecture by none other than eminent jurist, Ms. Nani Palkiwala. This was attended <coughs> by over 10,000 persons. <coughs> he organized a seminar on Karnataka Land Reform Act in 1973 and it was such a success that the state government took note of many of the suggestions made at the seminar and incorporated them in the 1974 amendment. He also served as vice president and treasurer of the Bangalore Advocates Association and was also an active member of the Karnataka State Commission of Juries, of which our uh, Honorable Chief Justice is chief patron. We are yet to meet uh, his lordship and invite him formally to the Jewish Commission, which is in the agenda. We are waiting for that. He was also the he served as the secretary of the Jewish Commission also. Mr. Chengappa taught he did not confine himself only to the courts. He also uh, was uh, a lecturer in law at the VB Puram Law College and uh, APS Law College. He was an active member of the Lions Club of Bangalore South, and he did not miss any program or of service activities held by the Lions Club. He was the first president of the Lahari Advocates Forum and the first director of the Lahari Advoc Associates Academy. He was also a trustee of the Lahari Foundation. Personally, he was a meticulously dressed person, always smiling, and seldom lost his temper. He was popularly called Caesar by his close friends. Tragically, on 19th May 2007, he met with a road accident and suffered severe injuries. Despite all efforts made by his family and friends to save him, he passed away on the same day. In a, it is uh, indeed a fitting tribute to the late Chengappa that Lahari Advocates Forum is arranging lectures and talks by eminent jurists every year in his uh, memory. Mr. Chengappa is survived by his wife, Mrs. Sushila Chengappa, whom I see, I, she attends every meeting and every lecture arranged in uh, memory of Mr. Chengappa. And his daughter, Anu Chengappa, who is sitting here and uh, smiling at us. She has inherited the legacy from her father and is now a somewhat busy lawyer. <clears throat> it is heartening that she, is, she has followed her illustrious father's footsteps and is a prominent member of many organizations with objects of protecting human rights and the rule of law. I thank the Lahari Advocates Forum for giving me this opportunity of saying a few words about 
Mr. P. G. C. Changapa. Thank you very much. Please on the dais and uh, Sri Rajendra Singh Chauhan to light the lamp. I request Sri Chandrasekhar Chanaspur to present a pan plant sampling to our guest of honor. I also request Sri Ra Rajendra Singh Chauhan to present a plant sampling to our chief guest. Thank you, sir. I request Madam Sumana Baliga to introduce us the guest of our honor. Pleasure to introduce our chief guest of the evening, Justice Prasanna B. Varale. Our Chief Justice has hails from the family that was closely associated with the father of the Indian Constitution, Dr. B. R. Ambedkar. Justice Prasanna Varale's grandfather, Sri Balvantra Varale, was trusted associate of Dr. Ambedkar and was chosen to take care of the educational institutions founded by Dr. Ambedkar under the aegis of People's Education Society. Under the chairmanship of Sri Varale, various educational institutions, including Dr. Ambedkar Law College at Aurangabad, were established. His Lordship's father, Sri Balchandra Balvantra Varale, was also a close associate of Dr. Ambedkar and after completing his degree in law, entered the judicial services and eventually served as district judge, registrar of Bombay High Court and registrar of Lokayukta. It is under such illustrious and experienced turtledge that Justice Prasanna Varale completed his law degree from Dr. Baba Sahib Ambedkar University and started practice at Aurangabad Bench, High Court of Bombay. He joined the chambers of renowned lawyer Sri Satyanarayana Loya and practiced on civil as well as criminal sites. He also served as a lecturer in law at Dr. Ambedkar Law College, Aurangabad from 1990 to 1992. Justice Prasanna Varale also worked as assistant government pleader and as additional public prosecutor at High Court bench at Aurangabad and was also additional standing counsel for the Union of India. Justice Prasanna B. Varale was elevated to the Bombay High Court on 18th July 2008. His Lordship assumed the charge as a Chief Justice 
of High Court of Karnataka on 1st July 2022. It is our honor to have you as a chief guest for today's function, sir. Now I request Lordship to have few words. My esteemed colleagues, Madam Chengappa, Anuji Chengappa, Sri Prabhuling Navadgi, Advocate General Karnataka, Sri S. Vivekananda, President Lahiri Advocates Forum, Senior Advocate Sri RVS Naikji, Sri M. Jagdish, Secretary Lahiri Advocates Forum, members of the bar present on this occasion. Ladies and gentlemen, Yelarugu Shubha Sanjay. Good evening to you all. It gives me an immense pleasure to join all of you and stand before you for this 16th PGC Chengappa Memorial Lecture. It is informed to me that late Sri PG Chengappa was a well-known versatile advocate and a leading member of the Bangalore Bar, who hailed from Kodagu district, which is known as Kashmir of South India and Switzerland of India. And uh, recently, I visited uh, Madikeri town, and I found, yes, it's uh, worth referring as uh, Kashmir of South India, with blessed with the natural beauty and scenic beauty. I was happy to visit this uh, Kashmir of South India. It is also informed that Sri Chengappa was a great lawyer and affectionate to all the advocates fraternity. It is interesting and worth to note that Lahiri movement was started by a group of advocates about 32 years ago to promote cultural and literary pursuits with the legal fraternity Initially, what started as a study circle came to be registered as a trust by name, Lehri Advocates Forum. I feel happy to note that Lehri Advocates Forum is promoting talent amongst the advocates and is conducting cultural programs, various competitions, and publishing in-house monthly newspaper communique pertaining to legal fraternity for the past 21 years. The forum is also conducting workshop and programs for budding lawyers' legal fraternity under Lahiri Journalist Guild. It is also praiseworthy to note the forum is conducting a study circle, Chintana Manthana, discussing various aspects of law and procedure once in a week in the premises of City Civil Court. <coughs> this reminds me, I must now share with you, a very beautiful principle in Bhagavad Gita, some of you must be knowing the principle known as Vade Vade Jayate Tattva Bodha. And it's very interesting for us as we are in the field of law and arguments is our routine. But it's very beautifully described in Bhagavad Gita about the principle. It is said that the arguments are of three types. First argument that you try to say, establish to say how you are right. Second type of the argument, you try to establish how you are right and how the another person is wrong. And the third and the best argument is this is what called as Vade Vade Jayate Tattva Bodha, wherein the argument is healthy and in pursuit to what? In pursuit to reach the truth. And this is what, as we the members of law and lawyers, I feel this principle we must follow. We are arguing on various subjects, various issues, but what our ultimate, ultimate goal, aim, and object should be to see that we try we try to reach near the truth and reach to the object that is providing the justice to do those who come to this institute with hope for delivery of justice. This is just a thought which came to my mind when I uh, 
heard about this chintana mantana uh, it's worthwhile to mention that the foundation is providing medical assistance to the advocates who are in need of such assistance and the academy conducts moot court model parliament quiz and various other competitions for the benefit of law students and younger members of the bar it is also hosting various seminars workshops and the uh, trust maintains a lahari book bank a collection of biographies of the eminent lawyers judges jurists the forum in accomplishing its dream has grown from strength to strength and is conducting endowment lecture every year on various facets of the law by renowned jurists of the honorable the apex court high court as well as the former judges of this court apex court the good work done by the trust in arranging the endowment lectures and imparting education to the budding lawyers and law students is praiseworthy valuable contribution made by late shri p g c chengappa to the legal fraternity is inspiring and commendable recently about a week back we have celebrated the constitution day across the nation and it is the duty of all citizens to work in tandem in achieving the constitutional goals and preserving the values enshrined in the constitution the lehri advocates forum in memory of cpg chengappa has selected an apt subject for endowment lecture that is constitution of india a transformative chapter as she prabhuling nawargi the learned advocate general is delivering his lecture and i have to set the tone i uh, would just say few things and i don't want to be an hurdle a hurdle between mr nawargi and the audience so i will not take much time i'll just share my few thoughts dr baba saheb ambedkar the principal architect of indian constitution and first law and justice minister of independent india was of the view to have a society where there is a harmony among its members where everybody lives with dignity and if the rights of an individual which are necessary for his survival or maintaining his dignity are violated he has every right to seek justice through the procedure established by the law it is said by dr ambedkar and i quote however good a constitution may be it is sure to turn out bad because those who are called to work it happen to be bad however bad constitution it may be it may turn out good if those who are called to work it happen to be good lot and quote dr rajendra prasad ji also in his words said and i quote if the people who are elected are capable and men of character and integrity they should be able to make the best even of a defective constitution if they are lacking in this the constitution cannot help the country it acquires life because of the men who control it and operate it and india needs to re nothing more than a set of honest men who will have the interest of the country before them the constitution is not just a blueprint for administration of nation but it is a document that emphasizes peaceful transformation of socio economic life of the people with intervention of the state the rule of law constitutional behavior democracy constitutionalism constitutional interpretation and harmonious construction separation of power independence of judiciary and liberty are the hallmark of indian constitution dr baba saheb ambedkar considered the values liberty equality and fraternity to be important and enumerated these values to develop in shit in the society dr ambedkar defined democracy as a better form of government than any other forms the three principles that is liberty equality and fraternity should not be treated as separate items the three cannot be divorced from each other the word constitutional constitutionalism we often use it and refer but what the principle of constitutionalism requires the control over the exercise of governmental power to ensure 
that it does not destroy the democratic principles upon which it is based. These democratic principles include the protection of fundamental rights, the principles of constitutionalism advocates a check and balance model of separation of powers. It requires distribution of powers necessitating different independent centers of decision making. Under the control constitution, the principal checks and balance have an important role to play. The principle of constitutionalism underpins the principle of legality, which requires the courts to interpret the legislation on the assumption that parliament would not wish to legislate contrary to fundamental rights. The Apex Court, in its judgment, in I.R. Coelho versus State of Tamil Nadu, reported in 2007, Volume 2, SCC 1, has said that the protection of fundamental constitutional rights through the common law is the main feature of common law constitutionalism. The constitutional law, Baba Saheb has said, and in his word, constitution is not a mere lawyer's document, it is a vehicle of life, and its spirit is always the spirit of the age. Honorable Supreme Court, in its celebrated judgment, in the matter of State of Karnataka versus Union of India, discussed the test whether the constitutional law or not could be done by exercise of ordinary legislative powers. The relevant discussion in para 68 reads thus, there is no clear cut distinction between what could be or should be and what could not be or should not be comprehended as constitutional law. In practice, a written constitution depends on the notion for the time being of the people who make it. It reflects their views about what should be considered fundamental as to find a place in the constitutional document. The Apex Court, in other matter, India Cement Limited versus State of Tamil Nadu, said that constitution is a mechanism under which the laws are to be made and not merely an act which declares what the law is to be. According to Dicey, constitutional law includes all rules which directly or indirectly affect the distribution or exercise of the sovereign power in the state. The other judgments, I'll just refer to them and not uh, go into those observations of the Apex Court, like Shankri Prasad Singh versus Union of India, Umaji Kesho Meshram versus Radhika Bai. Then as the other concept, constitutionalism, interpretation, and harmonious construction, I may only refer to often quoted judgment, that is Golaknath versus State of Punjab, this is a landmark judgment as well, all we all know. And the Apex Court has said, <clears throat> there is an essential distinction between the Constitution and the statutes. Comparatively speaking, Constitution is permanent. It is an organic statute. It grows by its own inherent force. The constitutional concepts are couched in elastic terms. Courts are expected to, and indeed should interpret, its terms without doing violence to the language to suit expanding needs of the society. In this process, and in a real sense, they make laws. Though it is not admitted, the said role of this court is effective and cannot be ignored. Even in the realm of the ordinary statutes, the subtle working of the process is apparent through the approach is more conservative and inhibitive. The Constitutional behavior is one of the terms which is again of recently of quoted. What is it? Constitution is document having special legal sanctity which sets out the framework and principal functions of the organs of the government within the state and declares the principles by which those organs must operate. The Constitution refers to a whole system of the governance of a country and collection of rules which establishes and regulate or govern the government. Many important rules of the constitutional behavior which are observed by the Honorable the Prime Minister, ministers, member of the legislature, judges, civil servants, 
are contained neither in the act nor in the judicial decisions. But such rules have been nomenclatured by the constitution writers to be the rule of positive morality of the constitution. And sometimes the authors provide name to it as the unwritten maxims of the constitution. Rules of constitutional behavior are those which are considered to be binding by and upon those who operate the constitution but which are not enforced by law of the court by the law courts nor the presiding officers in the house of parliament the term democracy again we do often refer to it and uh, we all uh, do those um, uh, read and uh, find in the speeches so i may not go into that aspect uh, but then i will just share some thoughts on the rule of law the rule of law has really three basic and fundamental assumptions one of that law making must be essentially in the hands of democratically elected legislature other is that even in the hands of democratically elected legislature there should not be unfettered legislative power and lastly there must be an independent judiciary to protect the citizens against the excesses of executives and legislative power and this is uh, observed in the judgment of the honorable the apex court in bachan singh versus state of punjab the rule of law is not merely public order rule of law is social justice based on public order the law exists to ensure proper social life social life however is not a goal in itself but a means to allow the individual to live in dignity and development of himself the human being and human rights underline this substantive perception of the rule of law with proper balance among the different rights and between human rights and proper needs of the society the substantive rule of law is the rule of proper law which balances the needs of society and the individual this rule of law that strikes a balance between society's need for political independence social equality economic development and internal order on the one hand the needs of the individual his personal liberty and his human dignity and on the other hand it is the duty of the court to protect this rich concept of the rule of law then there is the separation of power and then independence of judiciary this i may say some thoughts independence of judiciary is a part of the basic structure of constitution and cannot be permitted to be adversely impacted by policy making or even by legislative power the constitutional ethos of independent judiciary cannot be permitted to be diluted by acts of implied intervention or undue interferences by the executives in impartial administration of justice directly or indirectly <clears throat> for the judiciary to be impartial and independent and to serve the constitutional goals the judges must act fairly reasonably free of favor or fear the judiciary stands between the citizen and the state as a bulwark against executive excesses and misuse or abuse of the power by the executives it is therefore absolutely essential that the judiciary must be free from executive pressures or influences which has been secured by making elaborate provisions in the constitution with details impartiality independence fairness and reasonableness in decision making are the hallmarks of judiciary if impartiality is the soul of judiciary independence is the life blood of the judiciary without independence impartiality cannot thrive independence is not the freedom for judges to do what they like it is the independence of judicial thought it is the freedom from interference and pressure which provides the judicial atmosphere where he can work 
with absolute commitment to cause of justice and constitutional values. It is also the discipline in life, habits, outlook, that enables a judge to be impartial. Its existence depends, however, not only on philosophical, ethical, or moral aspects, but also upon several mundane things, security in tenure, freedom for ordinary monetary worries, freedom from influences and pressures within from others in the judiciary and without from the executive. The speaker, Mr. Prabhuling Navadgi, would certainly throw light on the subject. And I also uh, eager, I'm also eager to hear him. So without taking much time, I thank you all once again, the organization, organizers and the members. Thank you. I take great honor to thank His Lordship, the Honorable Chief Justice High Court of Karnataka, for all his words. And especially on behalf of all of us, I thank you, sir, for visiting, for taking your valuable time to visit our own Kashmir, sir. It means a lot for us. I hope and wish we all would tread only the path of truth as advised by His Lordships for effective delivery of justice. I now call upon Sumana to introduce to all of us the speaker of the day. Immense pleasure to introduce the speaker of this evening, our much admired Advocate General, Sri Prabhulin K. Navadgi. His grandfather, Sri B. K. Navadgi, was a well-known lawyer in the early 1930s, practicing at the then Bombay High Court. His father, Justice Sri K. B. Navadgi, was a judge of High Court of Karnataka and served Indian, Indian judiciary for a period of 27 years. Mr. Na Prabhuling Navadgi obtained his law degree from University Law College, Bangalore. During his student days, he has represented the college and university in various moot court competitions, debates, seminars, conferences in various parts of the country. He stood first in the Bangalore University in the five years law examination. He set up his independent practice in the year 1994 and has been practicing in High Court of Karnataka, Supreme Court of India, various commissions, tribunals, quasi-judicial authorities and tariff fixation committees. He, has, he was appointed as the additional Advocate General for the State of Karnataka on 3 6 2011 uh, to represent the state government and was the youngest additional Advocate General so appointed. He was designated as a senior counsel in June 2014. He was standing counsel for Karnataka State Board of Works for continuous period of 12 years. He is a member of Karnataka Lingayat Education Society and also a member of the Karnataka Chapter of International Commission of Jurists, Karnataka Chapter. He is also an advisor to sports bodies such as Karnataka State Cricket Association. He is also chairman of KLE Society's institutions. He has handled number of cases relating to bilateral investment treaties, international taxation, transnational taxation, double taxation, avoidance of agreements, particularly with reference to European unions, prevention of money laundering act, international arbitration, cyber laws, constitutional law, and infrastructure laws in the country. He has also advised several, several nationalized banks. He has represented the interest of union of union. Mr. Navadigi has addressed 
lectures in various law institutions and was invited to University of Salford, United Kingdom to deliver a lecture on comparative constitutional law. He was also invited by the University of Paris, Pantheon Sorbonne, France for delivering a lecture and was, was also invited to chair the session on overreaching of executive power at the 20th Commonwealth Lawyers Association held at Sydney 2017. He, he has also delivered lectures on transformative uh, constitution constitutionalism in various universities in the United Kingdom, including University of Warwick, Exeter and Newcastle as a part of lecture series organized by the British Council of India. Sir, I request you to give few <coughs> words on this. My Lord, the Honorable Chief Justice of Karnataka, Sri Justice Prasanna B. Varale, Honorable Justice Sanjeev Hanchati, Honorable Justice P.N. Desai, the additional Solicitor General of India, Sri M.B. Narvan, all my colleagues in the state government, additional Advocate Generals, the members of Lahari Foundation, and more importantly, the family members of uh, Sri, late Sri P.G.C. Changappa, distinguished invitees, all the younger students of law. I think uh, Sumana has spoken a little more than what I expected. I don't know how much I deserve of that. Before I begin the lecture, it is our duty to pay our salutations and pranams to late Sri P.G.C. Chengapa. The speakers preceding me have given a very vivid picture about him as to how he was just not a lawyer, but he participated and took interest in various activities. He was, uh, I was reading, a general secretary of the Advocates Association. He was actively associated with Lions Club for Social Work. He organized many lectures which included the great jurist Sri Nani Palkiwala. He participated in many other activities. But I really think it is uh, uh, of some interest if I have to share my personal, very little interaction I had with him. In my very beginning years of my practice, uh, he was the government advocate. I remember arguing a matter before His Lordship Justice Gopala Gowda. The question before the court was as to whether denatured alcohol was fit for human consumption. If it was unfit for human consumption, as you are all aware, it would go outside the sizin of the state legislature. So the argument I was uh, trying to make before the court was it was unfit for human consumption. I had to labor for two days before His Lordship Justice Gopal Gowda. At the end of two days, when I sat down, Justice Gopal Gowda looked at uh, Mr. Chengap and asked him, what do you say? All that he said is, I agree with him. This was the kind of fairness uh, uh, we had. Uh, that, that, that was an experience I will never forget in my life. That was the kind of fairness he exhibited as a government advocate. And uh, today, I'm very happy that uh, his memory is being carried on by Lahiri Foundation and a very able and eminent daughter in Anu Chengapa. <clears throat> Lahiri Foundation itself, I must uh, congratulate them for the kind of uh, um, activities they have undertaken. I was just thinking of uh, what Justice Hidayatullah says in his book, A Judge's Miscellany. He says a lawyer with a knowledge merely of law is just like a mechanic. But an advocate who trains himself in the field of art, literature, music becomes an artist. So I think for all of us as lawyers, such kind of uh, organizations who not only engage you in pure, position, pure learning of law, but engage you in other activities, are necessary to be an accomplished lawyer. Of course, on today's uh, topic, Constitution of India, a transformative charter. Before I say anything on that, I must also add a small caveat. When uh, Ms. Suman Baliga came to my chamber and asked me to deliver a lecture, 
I said lectures are delivered by accomplished authors, men who have achieved something, and I am a student of law. <laughs> but uh, she insisted. But then I thought, in my experience as uh, additional solicitor general for the government of India and advocate general now, my own experiences I must share to you as to how I have seen constitution work. But I am very conscious of my limitations, having regard particularly of the fact that the audience not only consists of some senior advocates and distinguished men, but it consists of the Honorable Chief Justice and the Honorable Judges, who themselves are embodiment of the great knowledge of constitutional law. So with their permission and salutations to them, I may share my thoughts on this subject. Constitution of India, a transformative charter. <clears throat> the reason why we chose the topic was, if you are to ask a student of law who is studying in first year law or second year, what does constitution mean to you? He would possibly say, constitution contains 395 articles, 12 schedules, three appendices, and it has undergone 104 amendments. That is what the constitution is for me. But over a period of time, now I understand what the constitution. As I see, constitution is not mere a textual document, a document which arranges, arranges the power between the different authorities. It is not a document merely which gives rights or obligations. It is something more. According to me, it is an aspirational charter given by the founding fathers. When they wrote that famous preamble, they spoke of justice, political, economic, and social. They spoke of liberty of thought, expression, belief, and faith. They spoke of liber they spoke of fraternity, they spoke of assuring unity or integrity of the nation. They spoke of dignity of the individual. They all spoke these things because this was their aspirations. The country which had freed itself from 200 years of British imperialism were deprived of these things. Therefore, what they were deprived what the generations before was deprived. They wanted to give that to this countryman. And therefore, I say the Constitution is an aspirational document of founding fathers. The Constitution is also a set of ideas, ideals, and values on which this great nation is built on. The Constitution is also a bridge between the past and the future. This is the Constitution is not mere a textual document. There is so much into it. But then no generation can be static. No nation can be static. So cannot be the Constitution. Therefore, the present topic is as to how the Constitution has changed over the last 72 years. Therefore, we say, constitution a transformative charter how it has transformed now i must bring to the notice of this very august audience that constitution has affected individuals institutions groups authorities and a nation as a whole it has affected in different fields but for the last 72 years how it has transformed the lives of individuals, how it has transformed the, uh, the institutions and various author authorities is a story by itself. For the purpose of the topic, I thought it would be interesting of some interest to most of you to see as to how the Constitution has transformed itself into four distinct areas. And the areas which we can divide are, firstly, Constitution, transformation of the Constitution relating to agrarian reforms. Secondly, transformation of constitutions relating to affirmative action. 
transformation of the constitutions relating to dignity of the individual, and lastly, transformation in strengthening political democracy in this country. Now, <clears throat> when I speak of how the constitution has transformed itself into agrarian reforms, we could see that uh, at the beginning of the commencement of the constitution, in 1950, we must all remember two articles, Article 191F, which was the fundamental right to property, and the unamended Article 31 as it stood then, which related to compulsory acquisition of property. Now, it was in this background, you could see how the concept of agrarian reforms was ushered in. Now, I was reading when I was preparing for this. Immediately after our independence, one of the primary tasks before our legislatures was two very bad legacies which we have inherited from the British and the Mughal emperors. One was the last Zamindari system, Jagirdari system, Mohatwari system and Rayatwari system. Fragmentation of holdings were not there. Large tracts of land were held by few individuals. This resulted in the first task of bringing what we call is land reforms or agrarian relations, agrarian reforms. It was in this background and ironically, it was the state legislatures who initially ushered in this land reforms. To begin with, it was Bihar land reforms. Maharashtra took the lead. Uttar Pradesh, Kerala, and also uh, Madras presidency. All of them brought in a lot of uh, legislations by which Tenures were abolished, rights were modified, and uh, lands were given to the tillers. Now, this legislation, 191F, is there, right to property as a fundamental right. Immediately, all of them were called into question before various high courts. Patna High Court immediately struck down this legislation on the ground that it violates fundamental rights. It violates the fundamental right to property. It violates Article 14, etc. Also, it violates, violates Article 31. Similarly, we had number of most of these legislations being struck. Now, this was the first challenge before the Parliament. We have said social justice in our preamble. <laughs> we have said liberty. We have said equality. But if Several of the lands are going to be concentrated in few hands, and we don't bring in social justice. How do we work? Therefore, we had the very first amendment to the Constitution in the year 1951, piloted by Dr. Ambedkar. The first amendment, of course, carries also at different chapters, but for the purposes of agrarian relationship, Two articles requires to be mentioned, Article 31A and Article 31B. Article 31A said, notwithstanding anything contained in any of the fundamental rights, any modification of tenure rights, etc., shall not be called into question before any court. I am only bringing, to the, bringing you the gist of the amendment, not the Article 31B, more or less, was a consequence of 31A. For the first time, they introduced the concept of ninth schedule and said, all those acts or legislations which are put in the ninth, inserted in ninth schedule, shall never to have been void or will never be called into question. So in goes all these legislations which were struck down by the various courts into ninth schedule, and they gave a deeming effect retrospectively, saying that they'll never be void. Therefore, protection was given. This was the, you could now see the first step toward transformation. The constant interaction between the courts and the legislature is a story of transformation. Now, Article 31A protected any of the land legislation if there was modification of rights or tenures. This was immediately called into question before the Honorable Supreme Court, as Lordship was mentioning in Shankari Prasad's case. 
Now, this is the beginning of the series of judgment we are all aware, relating to 31 and 19. <clears throat> now, Shankari Prasad, though the law relating to 31 and 31b was called into question, the arguments which were advanced was immediately went to some, some other article, that is Article 368. We are speaking of transformation, therefore Article 368 becomes very interesting and important because 368 is the only article in the Constitution which speaks of change, the power of the Parliament to amend the Constitution or rather change the Constitution. Now, the entire discussion in Shankari Prasad Dev's case is about Article 368. It was argued very passionately, saying that uh, the Parliament could not have tinkered and touched upon the fundamental rights. It could not have nullified uh, judgments of the courts, etc. And the question before the, the Honorable Supreme Court was, what is the scope and power of the parliament in amending the constitution itself under Article 368. Number two, as to whether <clears throat> law as contemplated under Article 368 would include law under Article 13, subclause 2. For my younger friends, students of law, I must just share so that they understand. 13.2 is any law made by the parliament, if it does not conform to part 3, is liable to be declared as void. Now the question was, and if 368, if any law was made and it, it did not run, it, it ran counter to part 3, it was liable to be de declared as void. That was the question. The bench was headed by Honorable Chief Justice M. H. Kanya. <clears throat> they by majority held. Article 368 is a power of the parliament which can amend the fundamental rights also. Secondly, they said, when you exercise the power of amendment under Article 368, you do not exercise the ordinary legislative power, but it is the power of the constituent power of the parliament. It's much higher than the legislative power. With these two conclusions, they upheld the First Amendment to the Constitution. Imagine if Shankari Prasad had remained and First Amendment had remained. It would have given the Parliament an absolute power to amend any part of the Constitution, including fundamental rights, and suspend the fundamental rights. Imagine uh, if uh, Shankari Prasad had remained they could have, uh, Parliament would have uh, said that we are, there is something called a constituent power and we can abrogate the constitution itself. But then, uh, as the story goes, it did not remain so. But somewhere in the year 1961, almost 10 years this position prevailed, in Sajjan Singh's case, the 17th Amendment to the Constitution was called into question. Now, the 17th Amendment as such was of not great significance, except that by this time, another 21 acts were inserted into 9th schedule. So this had become a pattern now. After, after upholding 31b, Every state legislature used to go and simply put it in, insert it in ninth schedule. Therefore, out it goes from the jurisdiction of the courts under 226 and 32. Now, Sajjan Singh's case, interestingly, uh, sought reconsideration of Shankari Prasad. And uh, the bench, uh, at that point of time, reiterated the position of Shankari Prasad. Except that uh, Chief Justice Hidayatullah and Justice Mudolkar strongly dissented with the view of Shankari Prasad. And uh, Hidayatullah very famously said, Part 3 is not a plaything of a special majority. 
and Mudolkar said, I can never agree with the principles laid down in uh, Shankari Prasad, but it was Gajendra Gadkar who said, uh, fundamental rights are not permanent and inviolate. Shankari Prasad was correctly decided, fundamental rights can be interfered or tinkered with even under Article 368. So, we have Shankari Prasad, First Amendment, 17th Amendment, Sajjan Singh reiterating position almost settled. That brings to what we now call as uh, the pre-fundamental rights case that is Golak in the year 1967, bench headed by Chief Justice Koka Subarao. Now, 17th Amendment is uh, again very interesting. It was about uh, uh, insertion of another 25 uh, act state legislation into Nine Shield. But 17th Amendment also became necessary because some of the high courts, particularly the Kerala High Court had held, the original protection given to this land reform legislation was only for modification of estates and tenures. But the Kerala High Court took the view, Jagirs, Mohafis, etc. cannot be considered as estates. Therefore, an amendment was brought about. They said estate includes Jagirs, Mohafis, etc. Therefore, the position stood restored. Now, Chief Justice Subara was very clear. He said, uh, there is nothing like a paramount power. There is nothing like a constituent power. And he explained that the power to amend the Constitution is not actually Article 368. He said it is only a procedure to amend the Parliament, a procedure to amend the Constitution. The power to amend the Constitution actually lies under Article 245, Entry 97 of List 1. That is the Legis that is a source of power relating to legislation. His first principle, therefore, was 368 is not a power at all to amend the Constitution. Power to amend the Constitution lies in 245, entry 97. Therefore, you, you have to judge your power only with reference to that. The concept, the question of uh, uh, any law under Article 13, sub clause 2 would include any, even amendment to the Constitution would, in, would include law. Therefore, if you violate Part 3, out goes the amendment and therefore you cannot touch the fundamental rights. Hidayatullah, of course, uh, specifically overruled Shankari Prasad. And uh, this became the position of law. Now, it was in the year 1967, but then we had, if, it, if this position had continued, possibly things would have settled. But we then had 24th, 25th and 29th Amendment to the Constitution. This was the possibly the beginning of the days towards emergency. The 24th Amendment now said and the amended Article 368 itself saying specifically that nothing in Article 13 will apply to Article 368. That was 24th Amendment. 25th Amendment took away the concept of compensation itself under Article 31. They said you don't have to pay compensation if you are to take property of a person. All that you have to pay is an amount. And what shall be that amount will be determined by the legislature. The re interrelation between deprivation of the property, etc. It also had several other amendments. 29th Amendment was again a formal amendment. By this time we had nine schedule being packed with almost 72 legislations. And 29th Amendment was all about that. Now, this was the background on which Keshavananda Bharati was set up. There are a number of discussions, I am sure you heard about Keshavananda Bharati. I will be as brief as possible because time is running out. Chief Justice uh, Sikri, Shahalat and Grover, Hegade and Mukherjee, Justice Jagan Mohan Reddy, Justice uh, Untwalia, Justice Vaidyalingam, Justice uh, Jagan Mohan Reddy, Justice uh, Palekar, and never to forget Justice Khanna constituted the 
bench, the lead judgment first comes from Justice Sikri, wherein he says fundamental rights can be amended. He says the concept of Article 368 not being a source of power becomes academic because 368 itself is amended, where Parliament itself says we have the power to amend the Constitution itself. And then, of course, for the first time, he spoke of constitution being a social document, constitution being an organic document. But the golden feature in the majority judgments, which includes that of Justice Khanna, is about the argument advanced by Mr. Palkiwala, which now most of you know is about basic principles, basic structure, essential features. The golden principle in all this, they say, is the parliament has the power to amend the constitution. It can amend part three as well, so long as you do not touch the basic structure of the constitution. Honorable Chief Justice in his very introductory remarks was mentioning to some of them. Palkewala gives a list in the Keshavananda Bharati. Justice Sikri lists something, lists few. Republican form of government, supremacy of the constitution, separation of powers, doctrine of checks and balances. Democratic way of government, periodical elections, etc. Several of them. But then they say this is not exhaustive but illustrative in nature. As and when time comes, we will see that uh, these features are developed further. Keshavananda Bharati, I will leave it at that. So the conclusion was parliament had the power to amend. Part 3 can be amended so long as the essential features are not affected, which for all purposes secure the citizenry of a future arbitrary government. I will conclude it by saying that. No despotic or an arbitrary government could have amended the constitution to take over the fundamental features after having listed out the fundamental. And this was the transformation which we undertook from 1950 to 1973. The last of the judgment in this series, I must mention, is that of Minerva Mills case. I wish they had accepted this position in Keshavananda Bharati and left it at that. No, it was not so. It was an incorrigible <laughs> government who thought it, no, we will go back once again. And they once again amended Article 368 and said that, this is not constituent power. This, they actually mentioned this is the constituent power. We are now exercising a constitution, constituent power, and therefore, any, any uh, challenge to this will not be available. In fact, they said any amendment made under Article 368 shall not be called into question before any court. They amended 31C and said, if any law is made, invoking the principle that this law is made for the implementation of directive principle state, state policy, it shall not be called into question. Virtually taking away the jurisdiction under 226 and 32. As I said, if they had accepted Keshavan on the principle, it couldn't have. This led to the last confrontation, again, this time Chief Justice Chandrachud, as he then was, Justice Bhagavati's six judges uh, writing one judgment headed by uh, Chief Justice Chandrachud, the other separate judgment is by Justice Bhagavati, Mr. Paul Kiwala's very brilliant argument again, 42nd Amendment to the Constitution. They read down 39C and said that this is something which affects the power of judicial review, therefore out it goes. Therefore, the Last, of course, I, I was thinking this was the last, but I must mention when I could hear the Honorable Chief Justice speak of Ayar Kohelo. The question is, therefore, what is the scope of the power of High Court and Supreme Court if an act goes into part nine schedule? That stands now settled in Kohelo's case where they say, if any legislation touches upon the basic structure of the Constitution after 1973, that is the cutoff date of Keshavananda Bharati. It can certainly be looked into by the court under 226 and 32. And it cannot be tested like an ordinary legislation. That is the position of law. 
So after having seen these agrarian relations, uh, agrarian reforms, what is that transformation the Constitution underwent? As I said, and I'll repeat it, transformation of the Constitution is all about a constant interaction between the legislature and the courts. And you have seen how Amendment 1, court strike upheld, striking down, for up to 44th Amendment. You can imagine. Number one, fundamental right to property was no longer a fundamental right at the end of it, repealed by 44th Amendment. Concept of uh, essential features of the Constitution, fundamental feature, basic features was introduced, which for all purposes would remain for all generations to come. Agrarian reforms came to be accepted by the courts as well. It would possibly shock anybody's conscience if 1950, most of these legislations being stuck down by the court today, you see, accepted, reduced. And lastly, the word amount compensation, Supreme Court interpreted, interpreted it by saying, compensation should have a rational nexus to the value of the property. So this is how the reconciliation took place between the courts and the legislature, and we have this position. It may not be the last word still spoken. <laughs> we may have different situations. If we have seen this, of course, now we have Article 19, 1F transformed into 300 capital A. A. We have right to acquisition laws have changed. Right to Fair Compensation Act has come. It has different connotations, etc. For the purpose of the present discussion, I will leave that. The second area which we must see where transformation took place is the area of uh, affirmative action. Affirmative action, protective discrimination, positive discrimination, I will say it's social justice, is a subject or is an area where you can see the constitution constantly undergo up to two months ago when EWS judgment was delivered. Now, possibly one of the most passionate subjects, passionate chapters in the Constitution is about affirmative action. Our country, at the time of independence, and soon thereafter, had a lot of discrimination based on caste, gender, etc. So one of the gigantic tasks before our constitutional makers was to usher in equality, usher in social justice. And how did they do it? They did it by introduction of Article 15. When they said, no person shall be discriminated only on the basis of caste, sex, place of birth, etc., residence. 15.3, interestingly, for all of you to know, they said the uh, state can make advancement for women and children. They only thought women and children will be the deprived class. Can, can take special measures. That means you can discriminate. That is positive discrimination. They came to public employment. They felt members should not be discriminated in public employment on the basis of caste. Therefore, they introduced the concept of equality in Article 16. Of course, this was preceded by Article 14, where they said there shall be equality of laws and equal protection of laws. Last article possible is Article 17, where by a constitutional injunction, they said, abolition of untouchability. These four articles we could see. We all thought we were moving towards social justice. Look at this, 15 says, no person shall be discriminated only on the basis of caste. The Madras government, reserved certain seats in favor of non-Brahmins, members belonging to scheduled caste, scheduled tribe, and backward classes. Now, Srimati, very famous, Champaka Dore Rajan, you must be all aware, filed a writ petition before the High Court and matter went up to Supreme Court. Her contention was, I have been deprived of my equal opportunity to participate because I belong to a particular caste. Now, this 15 one, according to me, was actually meant to give a protective discrimination to this. But here, the Constitution was turned on its head by this argument. 
So, as a matter of fact, the Honorable Supreme Court accepted that argument, struck down the Madras order, which was, which was termed as a communal Jew. It was known as a communal government order because communities were mentioned. And uh, this led to Dr. Baba Sahib Bhimrao Ambedkar introducing, as I was mentioning, First Amendment to the Constitution, which brought in 31A, 31B. But this was one of them. When he included for the first time, most of you will be, 154. When the, the first, therefore, the original protective discrimination in favor of uh, Shaduka, Shadulka and backward classes was by way of an amendment as a reaction to the Supreme Court judgment in Champakadwara Rajam, where 15.4 now says, the above provision shall not deprive the state of making advancement or reservations or taking such special provisions. It's actually the word is special provisions. For the purposes of person belonging to backward classes, scheduled caste and scheduled tribes. You could again see the transformation here. 16 was always there, 16.4 was always there. And uh, we always had a reservation in employment. But what was the extent or amount, amount of reservation was not known. I may bring to uh, the notice of the Honorable Chief Justice, he must be aware of it. Karnataka was possibly one of the forefront states or princely states in making affirmative actions. The then uh, uh, king of uh, Mysore state, Sri Nalwadi Krishna Rajwadiyar, had uh, constituted Chief Justice Miller to go into this aspect. And it was in the year 1931, reservations were given in the state of Mysore. That continued and uh, in 1961, it resulted in a reservation to the extent of 68%. Now, this is the state set up for MR Balaji versus state of Mysore. Nagan Gauda committee was appointed. Nagan Gauda recommended 68%, matter went up to Supreme Court. The question before the Honorable Supreme Court was whether this concept of reservation to the extent of 768 to 69% was reasonable can be held constitutionally valid, etc. Two principles their lordships uh, elucidated. One was they said, caste can never be the sole factor for making reservation. And Nagan Gauda committee was based solely on caste. It said that cannot be the only factor. Second principle was for the first time they introduced the concept of 50%. If you go through the judgment, you'll never see why they got this 50%. But they felt possibly 50% of the action should be protected, 50% should be protected. They said anything beyond 50% is liable to be declared as unreasonable and arbitrary. And Nagan Gauda Committee came to be set aside. And all states were confined to, uh, confined to uh, reserve or do affirmative action within this concept of 50%. After that, of course, we have had a lot of judgments on this. I will not refer uh, many of them because we will straight away go to Indira Swani. <clears throat> SV Joshi's case was one, arise, again arising from Karnataka, where 65% of reservation was affirmed by the Honorable Supreme Court. Matter was remitted back to the, high, uh, to the government. But it is Indira Sawney which again throws open different concepts on affirmative action and you could see the transformation which takes place. Indira Sawney, interestingly, uh, the matter uh, arises out of a very old report submitted by Sri Mandal to the government of India in the year, somewhere in the year 1979-80 wherein he had recommended that reservation to the other backward classes must be provided to the extent of 27%. Accepted by Mr. V.P. Singh when he was the Prime Minister in the year 1990, we are all aware, it led to a social backlash, matter group reached up to the Supreme Court, nine judges bench. The question before the, of course, Honorable Supreme Court has formulated number of issues fell for its consideration. First thing they say is, they to an extent take a different view from MR Balaji, they say caste can be the sole factor. And they say over centuries of our period, 
caste has been the sole factor for discrimination. So if caste is made the foundation of uh, protective discrimination, that is permissible. 50% of reservation, they accept it, but make an exception per 810, they say. Though this is 50% is a rule, but that is not a firm rule, there could be exceptional circumstances. A small window to breach 50% is given in Indira Swami. I'm using the word breach, but I will say ultimately cross 50%. Of course, uh, the judgment, Justice Thoman, Justice B.P. Jeevan Reddy, Justice Ratna Pandyan, Justice Kuldeep Singh, all of them have given different judgments. But interestingly, one of the honorable judges uh, says these are not matters which the courts were expected to decide. These were matters which the parliament was expected to decide. We are asked to decide, so we are, we are going to do it. So, Justice Pandyan in his judgment very passionately speaks of equality as to how concept of social justice which is there in the preamble has to be given its reality, etc. Indira Sohani is followed for a long period of time. As I was saying, one small interlude I will say as to how again the interaction between the courts and the parliament took place was in Indira Sohani, they also said, very interestingly, reservation is only at the, ins at the first point and not for promotions. So no reservation in promotions, it is only at the initial. Then you had the parliament react once again, Article 16, 4, promotion, reservation in promotion as a fundamental, right? Tested in Nagaraja, affirmed. This is the set. Now we come to the judgment arising from His Lordship's home state, that is Jayashri Patil versus state of Maharashtra. <laughs> Interesting case, I had a personal experience in appearing in that matter when it was referred to Constitution Bench because Jayashri Patil, when it was posted initially before His Lordship Justice Nageshwar Rao, Justice Nageshwar Rao stayed the judgment as well as the, the legislation, but then referred it to a larger bench. The reason was passionate argument saying that the concept of 50% uh, should be revisited. Indira Sony itself requires to be revisited, referred to a larger bench because Maharashtra had crossed 50% to the extent of 62%. The matter was before a five-judge bench. And uh, Jai Shri Patil's case, of course, the legislation was struck down on the ground that there was no quantifiable data. Insofar as 50% is concerned, they took a slightly different view, or rather I will say expanded Indira Swani principle saying that, yes, it is just not far-flung areas for which reservation needs to be given. There could be several cases in which you can cross the limit of 50%. 50%. If these were the principles, we had, uh, in fact, I must bring to the notice of this very august audience, we had specifically on behalf of state of Karnataka argued before the court that please do not treat this 50% as a golden rule because by that time 15.5 and 16.5 were amended. A reservation back based on economic, um, economic uh, resources was done. 371J was amended by which 8% reservation was given. Therefore, by constitutional intervention itself, 50% had crossed. Anyway, their lordships did not uh, advert to these issues. Now we have, last of the judgments is amendment to 15.5, as I was saying, 16.6, where for the first time they say, they change the very foundation of reservation affirmative section, says poverty, economic backwardness can be a factor for affirmative action. Now this is the policy of the government. Economic backwardness can be the basis of affirmative action. Tested before the Honorable Supreme Court, leading judgment by Justice Dineshwari, Justice Bela Trivadi and uh, Honorable Justice Pardiwala, dissenting judgment by R.S. Bhatt, seconded by Justice Lalit. But insofar as 50% is concerned, His Lordship Justice Dinesh Maheshwari says, this is not an inflexible and inviable rule. There could be cases where you can talk across 
and therefore reservation even if it is to cross 50% can be upheld justice uh, ravindra bhat in fact also seems to agree on this concept but differed it on different issues anyway it has its own contour some of the matters may be sub judice i will not go much but the point which i want to make before the very august audience is you could see the transformation again in fm matters relating to affirmative action the concept of bringing people who were left behind the mainstream initially curtailed by the supreme court to 50% now is no longer required to be 50% number 1 social and educational backwardness are not the sole criteria for the purposes of making affirmative action it could be historical social and educational backwardness it could be economic backwardness and most interestingly krishnamurthy's case well, and from mr dhyan is here he is appearing in those matters political backwardness can be a ground to make reservation is what the honorable supreme court now court now says in uh, uh, krishnamurthy's case so that is the transformation the constitution has undergone from the time when we were reluctant to provide reservations which was termed colored as communal geo set down today reservations are not considered an exception to merit but they are considered as the main bulwark for achieving absolute equality affirmative action is to correct historical injustice and uh, in indira sahani chief justice justice pandian speaking on merit says what merit is it if we leave out large sections of the society from the main street what is the merit what is the definition of a merit itself so this is the change which the uh, constitution underwent in so far as affirmative action is concerned as i was saying now we have political backwardness i may bring to the notice of all of you now the honorable supreme court in krishnamurthy's case says for making reservation on political officers it is not social and educational backwardness but you have to study political backwardness as well you could possibly never think in the year 1950 that we could go to this uh, this is the way we could never think economic backwardness though i must say in indira sahani specifically recognized that concept of creamy layer was recognized before i close this chapter i have to say something which i am always inspired of whenever i speak of affirmative action or equality if you are to see the book of sirwai on article 14 the very first chapter he quotes uh, the very famous speech of abraham lincoln in gettysburg address and it has always inspired me he says 40 years and 7 scores ago we bought on this land a nation conceived in liberty but dedicated to the thought that all men are equal and that is what is the foundation of article 14 15 16 and 17 one of the greatest service which possibly we could see or we could pay to our founding fathers is if we are to achieve social justice therefore i will end this by saying that transformative constitutional in so far as affirmative action is about to begin with it when it was social exclusion to social inclusion the third subject of course is of the how the honorable supreme court has interpreted and empowered individual dignity ak gopalan where 1951 where right to life was considered merely a right to life nothing more nothing less and if by a procedure established if you could deprive that person that was justified we have traveled a long way from ak gopalan to putta swami but it was in uh, menakan on this case which forms the paradigm shift in so far as individual empowerment is concerned i am now talking of citizen empowerment individual empowerment emancipation of rights expansion of rights as to how the constitution has uh, and the const parliament and the courts have constantly endeavored themselves towards this direction 
मैंने कहा गांधी मोस्ट ऑफ यू आर अवेयर ऑफ द फैक्ट्स बट द पोजिशन ऑफ लॉ इनाउंसिएट इज वेरी इंटरेस्टिंग दे सेट द प्रोसीजर एस्टैब्लिश बाई लॉ एज इट कवर्स अंडर आर्टिकल ट्वेंटी वन इज नियरली नॉट एन एस्टैब्लिश लॉ बट द लॉ मस्ट बी फेयर नॉन आर्बिटरी एंड मस्ट बी रीजनेबल लुक एट द इंटरप्रिटेशन पेड बाय इज लॉर्ड सिप जस्टिस चंद्रचू इट ऑल्सो सेट फॉर द फर्स्ट टाइम took a different view from Gopalan and Bachchan Singh and said all fundamental rights cannot be considered as individual silos but they must be read together they cannot be compartmentalization of fundamental rights it's a great paradigm shift it brought about a new era of rights under article 21 menaka gandhi after that of course we have had a number of judgments i was speaking to one of the professors of law when he said sir article 21 has been interpreted to have 21 more rights by the honorable supreme court right to shelter right to livelihood olga tell is right to a reasonable health care right to legal services and the 21 are there all these are transformation which the courts and the parliament undertook and therefore we had also article 21a right to free education which we possibly never thought of at the beginning of the constitution that's how we have progressed right to education under article 21 capital a has been made as special is a, is a special fundamental right up to the age of 16 years individual empowerment we have gone further ahead and recognized the third gender could never think in the year 1950 in navjo navtej johars and national legal services authority is recognizing them as third right third gender recognizing them as a human being for the purpose of enforcement of fundamental rights there is no end yesterday i was hearing i was part of the constitution bench in jalikat to the argument now is even animals are interested for rights in article 21 the jury is still at large we will see how the law develops but what is important is the last of the judgments which according to me is one of the most brilliant judgments under the under the scheme of constitution is right to privacy put also known as putta swami's case one of the most bril brilliant analysis of the constitutional law by his lord chief justice dhananjay chandrachur and uh, it is there he says very famously our preamble thinks of liberty there cannot be liberty without dignity there cannot be dignity without privacy therefore read privacy under article 21 but what is privacy what is privacy special privacy Dif partial uh, privacy what are the kinds of privacy he describes he says this center of the fulcrum of our constitution is individual dignity and you cannot practice dignity you cannot exercise your liberty if there is no privacy i think these are all matters these are all judgments which have gone long way in empowering our citizens and individuals in the scheme of the constitution it overruled karaksing etc and therefore we have uh, we come to an end in so far as uh, this uh, empowerment of individual dignities is concerned it's constantly evolving law <clears throat> the last of the tranches which i will deal in so far as transformation is concerned of course there are number of topics the last one is of and i will be as brief as possible is about strengthening of political democracy uh, it is said that uh, mere democracy is not sufficient mere political democracy is not sufficient you must have a democracy which is actually functional so when when we when you see at the inception of the constitution the concept of democracy was of course by periodical elections etc but the concept of universal adult franchise was there that every person irrespective of the caste everything was entitled to cast his vote that was the foundation in fact that forms part of the preamble as well but the transformation which has taken place now is is the concept of local self government 73rd amendment and 74th amendment again a huge shift recognizing grama panchayats power to the lowest uh, lowest strata and being recognized under the constitution we had intrusions 
no election to the to the post of a prime minister or a, could be called into question struck down by the courts saying that all are equal under the democratic system periodical elections bound to be held a creation of a independent election commission but when parliament was confronted of a slightly unman i won't use the word unman slightly out of bounds election commissioner it created a multi member election commission again a transformation therefore uh, strengthening of political democracy uh, supreme court reading the representation of people act asking the candidates to declare their criminal antecedents etc these are all matters where we could see the huge transformation which the country has nation has undergone in strengthening political democracy again by legislative intervention and by judgments of various courts of course there could the the a discourse on constitution can never end it could possibly go on and on but uh, time demands that we end but when i chose this topic i had something in my mind the fulcrum of my topic was i felt the concept of transformative constitutionalism when i studied transformative constitutional few years ago constitutionalism what appealed to me was a very interesting feature as to when the three great organs under the constitution judiciary legislative and executive can they all come together for something which is very common but what stares at our face is the very concept of independence of judiciary doctrine of powers and doctrine of checks and uh, doctrine of separation of powers and doctrine of checks and balances but keeping in these things strong keeping th these things intact can all these three organs come together and that seems to be the recognition some of the uh, western jurisprudence seems to now say and we had several examples in this and as an advocate general to the surprise of many of you you may be seeing this concept of transform i have seen this transformative constitutionalism actually at work most of the judgments when delivered by the courts the first reaction of the executive i will say is more of deference than deference that is the the first reaction is uh, we have made the law or this is our action this is what the courts have said they are correct this is what we will implement unless a different view is taken for other reasons this is where transformative constitutionalism is there i am not happy to see legislations which begin by saying notwithstanding anything contained in any judgment or law <laughs> unless this becomes necessary these are things which we should avoid and i have honestly felt and seen particularly during covid uh, period mr nargund is there he was to appear for the central government i used to appear for the state government the judiciary legislature and executive all came together for the purpose of a common good common good this is the uh, i will say the greatest tribute we could possibly pay to our the constitutional because therefore uh, what is etched in my memory and i will end by this by saying only this much is uh, when i begin this idea of all what could be that area of convergence uh, i would hit a road block i did not know what to say where where is that this areas could come but i found the answer in uh, none other than by very excellent speech delivered by his excellency uh, uh, the president of india on the constitutional day when she said uh, doctrine of checks and balance to theek hai <laughs> kahin na kahin janasadharan ke liye janta ke liye aap sab logon ko ek sath mein aana chahiye and uh, there cannot be a better statement by the first citizen of the state or of the country i am grateful that i have been given an occasion to share my thoughts today i hope and pray that the memory of mr ptc sangapa is kept alive by many more such lectures i am particularly grateful to the honorable chief justice who has had the patience to on a after a long day of judicial work and a long week of judicial work to sit with us and hear me sir we are very very happy and grateful that you are in our midst 
I must thank each one of you for giving me a very patient hearing. Wishing each one of you all the very best. Thank you. Student of law should in itself be a lesson to many of us. The ease in which uh, you handled the subject today, the manner in which you, you uh, kept the entire audience on your side, not only you held them with your words, you made them sway to your words, uh, sir, uh, substantiates why most of us, many of us, most of us, dread the day you oppose us in courts. Thank you, sir, for such a beautiful and uh, enlightening speech. I now request Mr. M. Jagadish to deliver the oath of thanks for today. Justice Prasanna B. Varali, Chief Justice, High Court of Karnataka, Shri Prabhulik Navadgi, Advocate General, Karnataka, Yes, Vivekananda President, Lahiri Advocates Forum, Happy New Year to all. As all good things come to an end in life, so is this lecture for the day. On behalf of Lahiri Advocates Forum, I take this opportunity to propose a vote of thanks to those who have directly and indirectly contributed to this lecture on Constitution of India, a transformative charter organized by our forum. At the outset, I thank our chief guest, Sri Prabhulik Naki Navadgi, Advocate General, Karnataka. We are really enlightened with your knowledge and presence. Few points which I made is, he shared from his personal experience, he also said aspirational charter given by our founder fathers. He also shared four things, aggregarian reforms, affirmative actions, individual dignity, and strengthening political democracy. We are all inspired by your great words, sir. Now I request Madam Madhavi to hand over a momento from our forum, please. Thank you, Madam. I thank our guest of honor, Honorable Justice Sri Prasanna B. Varale, Chief Justice, High Court of Karnataka, for the insights on today's lecture. What I liked in it is, it took us straight to Switzerland of India, brought us back within no time to our own place where we are sitting here. You also said arguments are of three types, how you are right, how you are right, however, how you say that other person is wrong and try to reach your truth. You also shared about landmark judgments and rule of law. We are all really touched by your words, sir. Now I request Mr. Grish Kodgi to hand over a memento from our forum. Our heartfelt thanks to judges of Honorable High Court of Karnataka, judges of District Judiciary, Registrar General High Court of Karnataka, Registrars of the High Court of Karnataka, Private Secretary to Chief Justice, Directors, Deputy Directors, Faculty and Training Judges of the Karnataka Judicial Academy, Additional Advocate General, Additional Solicitor General for the High Court of Karnataka, State Public Prosecutor, Senior Counsels, Office Bearers of Committee Members of various Forums like Bar Council of India, Karnataka State Bar Council, Karnataka State, also Advocate Association of Bangalore, Office Bearers of Committee Members of International Commission of Jurists, Karnataka Chapter, Directors of Advocate Academy of Bangalore, President of Literary Union, Principals of Principals, Law Lecturers, and Students of various law colleges, Family and Friends of late PGC Chengappa, Media, Brothers and, brothers and Sisters in the Legal Fraternity, guests of the legal fraternity and other participants for active participation, even though it has exceeded the time. Having said that, I also would like to thank our president, dignitary and dayas, and gentlemen, and even like this cannot happen overnight. The wheel started rolling months ago. It requires planning and bird's eye view for details. We have been fortunate enough to be backed by a team of very motivated, dedicated, well-known wishers of Lahiri Advocates Forum, who know their job and are result-oriented, which you witnessed it. As a special thanks to 
Mr. Sumana Balika for coordinating the entire program for the last few months. I request our Madhavi to hand over a sapling to advocate Sumana Balika. Also thank Senior Council Mr. RVS Nayak who gave an who brought back our PGC amongst us. We will never knew about it, but thank you so much, sir. We could witness how the person is. I have not seen him. Thank you so much. <laughs> Today's Master of Ceremony, Mrs. Vidyulata, role takers, Mr. R.G. Chauhan, Mr. Chandrasekhar Chanaspur, Mr. Girish Kodgi, Mr. Sharat Aryadhyamath, Mrs. Madhavi, Ms. Mamata, Mr. M.D. Harun Rashid for their unflinching support and condemnation. With these warm words and kind messages, we move to the end of today's lecture. One request is, we have a wonderful book which is available there. Each one of you kindly take one book about our speech today. With this, I end this lecture. Thank you very much.